Hey, Mariner fans. Happy Monday. Welcome to the se- second episode of the 2023 season, the year of Thai France and the year of the Mariner. I'm Max Schwabe here with Chris Swifel and Chris Sw- Soba, Evan Barron behind the camera. Uh, we have a very special interview for you guys today. It's the one and only, the man, the myth, the legend, not the myth, just a straight up legend. He is real. He is real. He's a real dude. Uh <laughs> The president of baseball operations for the Seattle Mariners, Jerry Apoto. Uh, We have an opportunity to ask him what it's like to, you know, be in his role, the nature of his work and, you know, ask, get a better sense of inside the mind of a general manager, president of baseball operations. Um, We're also coming at you from the Silver Cloud Inn in Soto, right in between both the stadiums, both Loon Field and T-Mobile Park. Um, next door neighbors with T-Mobile next Park. Door yeah. neighbors. next door neighbors. Our uh, room just so happens to look out towards uh, the stadium, which is great. Um, and you know how when you listen to you know podcasts and all that jazz, you, you get you get promos, right? Well, this is the first promo that we can come at you with. Um, if you're from out of town and you like watching the Mariners and you want to come visit uh, T-Mobile Park during the regular season. You can now go to Silver Cloud Inn and use promo code MONMOJO, M-O-N-MOJO, for 10% off of your next day here down in Silver Cloud Inn, Soto. Is it exclusive to this hotel? Probably. Probably. Well, anyway, um, we have Jerry Depoto for you. Our listeners, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe. You can also find uh, the link to our promo code on our Twitter and Instagram. Uh, but please share this with your friends. We've got a lot more interviews coming for you uh, this season. And as always, go Mariners. We have a special guest today. Uh, the man with the plan, uh, president of baseball operations, Jerry DePoto. Jerry, thanks for being here, man. Glad to do it. Yeah. It's uh, just another Friday yeah. in our off season. Well, it sounds like you've already had quite the Friday, but what I wanted to know is today's Friday the 13th. Are you a superstitious guy or we've been talking, we think you're more of a trust the data kind of guy. I am. I, I will say that there were more than a few years of my playing career was it where I would qualify or have qualified myself as a bit superstitious. Yeah. And for reasons I'm not quite sure, as soon as I retired as a player, just dropped all of them. And, <laughs> that's, uh, and, and even today, I've, I've met very few players that aren't in, on some level superstitious, even if they don't count it as a superstition. And we, are, we have determined in baseball that we're not superstitious. We just, we just have our routines. Yeah. And, and we're, we're slave to those routines. Right, well, as w- uh, with someone in your position, I, I don't think there's a lot of room for superstition. I, one might be able to argue. I don't. <laughs> well, what about back in the day then? What were some of those superstitions? Uh, some of the superstitions included, you know, where I would sit on the bench if I were, you know, coming in and and, and expect it, you know, like an up down outing where you were gonna yep. uh, go back out and pitch. I, I was one of those never step on the the, the foul line guys. Yep. I I went, you know, multiple consecutive years wearing the same sliding shorts under my uniform because <laughs> you know, they happened to be. It, Pretty good for me the first of those years, and I and I rolled with them for about three years until they roughly crawled off my body. And what, what are you wearing sliding shorts for? Yeah, uh, you, did you do a lot of well? <laughs> yeah, you're the ball. Otherwise, it could, get, it could get pretty hairy out there when you're moving. <laughs> you know, something's got to hold all the. the you didn't know so. uh, Jerry Pinch ran for uh, yeah, right. Uh, he was a fast guy. I did run the bases? Did uh, you really? Yeah, I ran the bases on a couple of occasions. A quick funny story if, to start, if you don't mind. Please. We have uh, so this is 1997, and and I've 1998. One of those years, and and I've been in the National League for I think three or four years. And um, after spending the first ten years of my career with the Indians uh, organization, or or six years, but you know, including my college time and and minor league time, there I hadn't hit in a decade. And then I traded the Mets in 1995, and immediately got thrown in there and hit a handful of times. You know, with more than a handful, by my estimation. Yeah. And, with the Mets and, and then went to the Rockies, you know, did a little bit more, you know, uh, standing in the batter's box. And then we, we were playing Atlanta one night at Coors Field and, and I wind up 
get I get a hit, and it, you know the the planets align. The and contact. I, yeah, I think it was a rocket. Yeah. And the, <laughs> yeah. the history will show that it was a rocket. I was a pitcher too, so I, I was a PO as well, so I get it. <laughs> we, it so I, I had a screamer back through the middle, and I got to first base, and and our first base coach was Clint Hurdle, and I started screaming, you know, I, hey, get that ball, yeah. get that ball, yeah. and Clint's got this bellowing voice, and you know, and he yelled. You know, hey, ball, get the ball. And Fred McGriff was the first baseman for the Braves who we were playing that night. And, and McGriff came up behind me and he said, is that your first hit? <laughs> and, I, and I said, yeah. And, and immediately he went from holding me on to standing Just about stand, 15 yeah. feet yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was like, he's not going anywhere. <laughs> that's great. Um, so, you know, outside of Chris flooding your inbox, right, um, <laughs> You know, like we said, we're, we're not recognized by Major League Baseball. We're, you know, we don't have any credentials. So outside of just being a really nice guy, you know, why else are you here? What, what brought you on the show today? Uh, first, A, I love the Mariners. I love talking about the Mariners. I love talking about baseball. It's a, you know, it's, it's a pastime for, for me as, as much as it's a job. I've loved it since I was a kid, and I appreciate the people who love it, you know, and and when you have an opportunity to connect with, with the, the people who show up every day and support your team and, and give them some reason outside of the obvious, which is totally. you know, great players to come watch, there's, we, we've got a great story to tell. And, and why wouldn't you want to talk about what we do every day? It's so much fun. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I love that. And on, kind of on that story and something I'm curious to learn about from your perspective is – Going back to 2015, when you were in the interview process, I'm not even sure what it looked like when you were trying to be back then the GM of the Mariners. How did you sell yourself to the ownership group, to the people, you know, bringing the GM on at that time? How did you sell? Obviously, we know your philosophy. You know, it's it's draft, it's develop, it's trade, it's control the zone. How did you pitch that to to the ownership group? Just like that, uh, you know. We're going to draft. We're going to develop. We're going to control the zone. And I, it's, it's, yeah. Especially when they're when you when you're working with a team that has a drought, right? That's that's so hungry for the postseason. You know, therein I think I had some level of advantage because you know one of the priorities for the Mariners at the time was experience, and you know I had worked the previous four years or it, you know it, roughly two weeks prior to that I was working with the Angels and. And I was coming off a four-year stretch where we won about 54% of the time, and, and we went to the postseason in 2015 or 2014. And we were, you know, a, I was a year removed from a 98-win team. And, and I think that carried a little bit of weight coming in the door is, is having had those experiences. And, and uh, you know, to, to my benefit, or I guess I was fortunate enough to land the job, I think, because of that. Uh, you know, just what the resume looked like. And you know, is what the you know what the pitch was similar to what you just said, and and add to it, you know, the core is here. And at that time, you know, you had Robbie Cano and Nelly and Felix and Seeger, especially that quartet. You know, Kuma, if you wanted to, to make it a quintet, and and the, the the support group on the roster wasn't where it needed to be. You know, mm -hmm. the the other twenty spots were were short of where it needed to be, and uh, you know, I, I I think in my final interview or the final stage with John Stanton and Jeff Rakes, who were the, the final stage for me at that time, uh, I said, I said, you know, I don't, I don't feel like this team's very far away. It's just a few turns of the screw. And then we made about 7,000 trades. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, laughingly at our first owners meeting, Jeff Ray Rakes said, is that what a couple of turns of the screw look like? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, actually, uh, we had a funny, fun uh, question from the dugout, as we call them, our fans. Uh, that Listeners. We're asking if uh, you were always a, a trader, like even back at the lunch table at uh, middle school, and uh, what what a PB and J sandwich went for back then, and if uh, if it's a higher price now. You know, it's a, a, maybe not with PB and J sandwiches, but definitely with baseball cards. And yeah. uh, you know, I, I grew up a, like a psycho baseball card collector. Loved to trade them with my friends, and and uh, you know, did that well into you know my my like teen years adult life. And, and you, you know, gifted Justin Hollander's kids. Uh, that's right. A bunch of baseball cards. That's right. How did you know that? Um, I, I listened. To, I listened to everything. We do our research. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, 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 I had, a, I had, you know, albums of every Mariners card, you know, that, that ever came from Tops, and and uh, we gave them to, to Elliot when he became a, a, a 
baseball card enthusiasts think it's a great hobby. But, you know, started trading then. And then, you know, in the 90s, the early 90s, right about the time that rotisserie football turned into, you know, fantasy league, mm-hmm. and we started playing fantasy league football around the, the league, that's when, you know, the, the, the trading thing became a, 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 a thing, a challenge. Yeah. And, and I did that, you know, for years in, in, through the 90s and made a ton of trades and, and had some fun playing fantasy football until my day job ate up too much of the schedule. Uh, on, the, on the topic of trades, we were doing some reading. Back is way more common back in, you know, the late, like, early 1900s and whatever. There are trades for, like, like washing machines or, or food items included yeah, in ma- I, Major League Baseball deals. Obviously, today, those aren't, those aren't happening. But in your experience, whether it was player, whether it's been in management, what's, what's a trade that you've, like, something out of the ordinary has been involved? And you're like, what? That makes no sense. But any, anything? If they ever existed. Anything? Yeah. Th- those trades that existed back <laughs> in the day, like, yeah. with some great, great players, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, I, that, like, I, I do think that, you know, through the course of my career, knowing some, you know, maybe more baseball history than, than many people mm. who are, do what we do every day, you know, I'm always fascinated to, to when we see an opportunity to do something that's never been done or that hasn't been done in many years. You know, we, we had a, you, you remember Wade LeBlanc. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, you know, we, we acquired Wade. Um, we acquired Wade and then had an opportunity to trade Wade back to, uh, I think we acquired him from Toronto, you know, and the agreement when we took Wade was, was, we need him now. We have a spot open, and he's going to pitch in the big leagues. At the time, he was in AAA for the Blue Jays, you know. And the the trade was for cash considerations, you know, mm-hmm. a player to be named or cash. And you know, as it worked out, Wade performed very well for us, and and we were teed up to then trade him back to the Blue Jays for himself, you know. And but the the league put the kibosh on it. We couldn't do that deal, and that was like an homage to a deal oh. that was done in the in the early '60s mm-hmm. with Harry Cheedy who became the only player in history ever traded for himself. And, you know, he was the player to be named later in a trade. Yeah. That, sent him <laughs> that is to the Mets. And, and, uh, and we had the chance to do that. And, I, you know, I've collaborated with the, the Blue Jays guys, yeah. with Ross Atkins, and, and we talked about it internally. And then when we got down to it and it was time to, to go back and execute the back end of it, you know, the, the league put the kibosh on it. We were we were forced to put Wade on waivers. He went to the Pittsburgh Pirates, and then we wound up getting him back for a second tour of duty later. So it wasn't <laughs> so it wasn't like Wade LeBlanc for a washing machine or something. No, like that. but Wade LeBlanc for himself, yeah. you know, which would have been a fantastic trade. <laughs> That's great. Uh, okay, so uh, June eighteenth, right? You guys uh, have the Angels in for a five game series, which you know I don't really remember the last five game series. I remember Weird. seeing it on the calendar. Weird. I was like, what the heck is going yeah. on here? Um, Crucial series, but we drop four or five, and um, the record goes to 28 and 36. Um, and this has kind of been the year that, you know, Mariner fans were juiced up about these Mariners. We know what happened after this series. You guys go on to win 23 of 25, including 14 in a row. But after that series gets done with the Angels, is there ever a time where you sit and you go, it should be working? I, I see these guys, I put these guys together. I believe in this thing. Any doubts creep in um, when you guys are 28 and 36 at that point of the year? You know, this one, and this is maybe the curse of, of my being who I am. I, I tend to be overly positive, and, you know, and that's genuine. I'm, I'm that way downstairs. I very rarely, once we move past a moment, once we move past an acquisition, I don't really look back much. Yeah. I just focus on what comes next, and I – I never looked at it as how did we get to this point. I looked at it as we're better than this, and you know, and we all thought we were better than that. Totally. We had some very unusual circumstances to deal with, and you know, and we dealt with them. And you know, the the way the team responded after that Angel series was uncommon, incredible, and, and it was mm-hmm. just a. It, it, it became one of the most enjoyable, it, just the second half of our season in general, or from mid June to the end. But if you even went back to you know, mid May, when when I would say our, our our pitching really started to show up, it just became such a fun season. And when we wound up uh, finishing the the deal, and we we had our clincher against Oakland, and and we're sitting in Scott's office afterward, 
you know, taking soaked in shot. champagne, taking <laughs> yep. fireball shots. And, uh, you know, Scott got up and he, and he's still wearing his hat and he threw his hat on the, the desk and he turned around and I was sitting in the room, Justin, Andy McKay. Right. Uh, and, and Scott shook his head and he said, you know, he said, it was, it was up and down a roller coaster ride, but we got here. And I said, roller coaster what are you talking about man he said do you not remember the, the five game series with the angels i said no i shut it out bro i shut it out that's that your job I yeah. the players right. on the field man you yeah, yeah that, i mean that's got to be a critical part to your work jerry right like being over overly positive that's never been my forte just ask these guys <laughs> i'm more of a, a realist but from the outside i'm perceived as a pessimist but um when we talk about the nature of your job, right? Like, what, and actually this is, um, this comes from another question from one of our listeners, Cam Breen. Um, like, what has been, you know, when you're in the nature of, of, you know, developing relationships with young, young guys and, you know, getting to know them and watching them grow, like, what has been the hardest time you've had parting ways with a player? Or like, you know, if you can't think of a specific instance, like, how does that affect you know your work and and your um, positive mentality direction right? Yeah, I think you know I think it's always hard. There, there's and this is going to sound easy, but in well during my time in Arizona with the Diamondbacks yeah. and this you know so this ranged from you know the end of the 2005 season until the the, the time I went to Anaheim uh, and after the the postseason in 2011. It, during that time when I'm working in both scouting and player development, you you gain such a connection with your players. Right. You know, I, I, as, as an example, we recently signed A.J. Pollock. A.J. was was one of our first-round draft picks in those years. You know, I was there from the moment we, we scouted him. I watched him play a ton at Notre Dame. Yep. We're in the draft room arguing him up and down the board. He goes out in our system, excels, shows up. As, as a big leaguer and, and and has what has turned out to be an excellent major league career and you feel connected to it and i and i would say that happens with with each one of your guy your guys and when you make the trade when you pull the trigger and make a trade with a player that you drafted signed and developed yep. it is very hard to make that trade and each one gets a little bit harder than the last. Yeah. And and I don't know that there was that there has been one that was any tougher for me than Edwin Arroyo last yeah. summer. You know, is because we it, it's it's so fresh for us. Ed, we were so excited to add Edwin to our organization. We thought the upside was, you know, much much higher than he was being given credit for in his draft class. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was the youngest player in his draft class, super athletic, excellent defender, and we thought there was a lot of potential in the bat. We brought him to Seattle. He went through a, a workout. We got to know him a little bit. He lit us up with, with his, you know, his offensive skills, yeah. or at least what the potential that existed. And then he went out and roughly crushed it in, in Modesto. And you know, ultimately, we spent weeks, uh, and, and when I say weeks, it was weeks with multiple phone calls a week that were – agonizing trying not to include Edwin in in that particular mm -hmm. trade but you know ultimately knowing or feeling it was the smartest thing we could do for the organization and and like so many players when the reaction when you get the reaction from those players those young players they the day they signed they always thought they were going to be mariners mm -hmm. you know yeah. and and that's a that's a a really heartbreaking moment when you have to deliver that news yeah. but you know it i guess to some extent, it goes away when you know on the other side of it, you that player is going to be given an opportunity. He gets the chance to go, you know, make his hay in a new organization, and you get your own all-star pitcher walking through the door, and and you get used to it a little bit. But it is, it's a different form of heartbreaking every yeah. time. And so, I think that's a testament for with players being heartbroken today. Edwin Arroyo, for example, with them leaving the Seattle Mariners, that's a testament to what you and company have been able to build. I feel like when I, I remember when we traded last year for, for Jesse, for Gino, and seeing and hearing their interviews and the words coming out of their mouths of them talking about the Mariners organization are words I hadn't heard other players mean when they say them. And mm -hmm. excited about coming to a team that actually has a legitimate chance for fighting for uh, an AL West title for, you know, for going to the World Series and being having that culture that, that has been built today with every single player now on our team is brought by you 
in in you no more inherited that's just a, a testament to the culture that we have and it's a good culture people want to play here that's something i don't think we've experienced as fans for the most part of our 21 to 20 plus year yep. fandom yep there's and i haven't really experienced it a ton in my career either and and uh this and it's a testament to our the quality of the people in our major league clubhouse it because it, whether it starts from the bottom and moves its way to the top or vice versa as you said you know every player in there came with this regime you know the mm -hmm. group that we are with today and those people i just mentioned in scott's office it's so many people in scouting and player development our front office group our yeah. hp group but it's the the players that grew up in our system it's the julios it's yeah. the cal Raleigh's, it's the logan gilberts and george kirby's it's a, they a lot of what has happened in our organization a lot of why the vibe is so good a lot of why our culture has really shifted in such a positive way is because that group came through together they understood what we were trying to get to i think they believe in the people around them mm -hmm. in a way that's uncommon in in baseball today and and uh and as a result the energy that young players who believe bring to the table is it's insane, and and you know Scott from the moment we got here talked about the value of, of young players with energy, and, yep. and we got here we just didn't really have that, and you know it took a while to to foster it. I think we have it now, and now we can inject a, a guy like Wink or Gino. We can inject a Colton Wong or a Teoscar Hernandez, right. and right, because because enthusiasm off the charts. Yeah, right? exactly. Because I, I think about it, you know what to to what you're referencing, right? Like watching. Uh, Robbie and Nelly and Seeger go three, four, five, right? And they, and they brought most of the energy, but you're totally right. I think, you know, starting from, from the ground level and then inserting like those middle career veterans, right? Like then you have, and then you're watching JP Crawford, you know, like, live, leader, live yeah. up, you know, exactly. Um, so I couldn't agree more. That's. I'm, uh, I'm curious it, it, when. We're, we're such a data-driven team, and one of my favorite things about baseball is the unmeasurables. And I think Andy McKay is the person that we initially brought in to help with that, whether it be improving the mentality of somebody, uh, their clubhouse vibe, what they'll bring into it. When, we're, when you guys are going out, whether it be via trade, whether it be open market, is there an algorithm, is there an equation, some sort of formula you have to try and measure those unmeasurables, the, the stats that don't have the batting average, WRC+, plus, their culture. How do you measure that? You know, when we first got here, we, would, we spent money, you know, on programs that would you know, deliver us some type of feedback on, on a third-party, I guess, subjective opinion on how a player was wired, how he would fit in based on his, his, his psychological, emotional traits. We don't do that anymore. You know, we rely on our own people to do it. Andy's a big driver there. Yeah. And, I, and I would say that, that Andy sits at the intersection between or where traditional coaching meets, you know, the, the power of the mind. Mm -hmm. and, so he's like the principal, right? Of, uh, it's, in so many ways. Yeah, he's he's like had a chance to, to speak with him and, the, and, and uh, he kind of laid out his, his um, strategy. And yeah, and it was, Flawless. Yeah, it's phenomenal what yeah. he does. And I, the, the, I, I will say, I played, I came up through the Indian system, like I mentioned earlier, yeah. he, you know, a, as a player. And my first farm director was Dan O'Dowd, who mm -hmm. went on to be a longtime GM, my GM uh, in Colorado at the end of my career, and, and has been a, a personality on MLB Network for, for years now. You know, Dan had Andy with the Rockies as a as a mental skills coach, mm -hmm. uh, and I called Dan, who had recently left the Rockies, you know, at that time, and I asked him. I said, if I were to to consider Andy McKay as a farm director, would I be out of my mind? And he said, Buddy, you did. He said, You make that move, it's yeah. going to be the biggest yeah. win that you'll ever have. And uh, you know, and we, and and I have to say, looking back. Yeah to 2015, which is the first time I, I met Andy. I'd, I'd not known him before. He sat in, in a suite with me, and we talked about this opportunity. And, and uh, it's, it's been truly one of the, the most organization-shifting moves we could have made. He's been a great ad. So talk to us about his responsibilities coming up as assistant GM now. What does that look like? Yeah, you know, now he'll take on, sit, still sitting at that intersection. Yeah. Obviously, he will oversee Justin Toole and what is happening in our player development department. 
He will continue to oversee our mental skills programs and the development there. He's also going to take on oversight in our educational programs. And not just with, you know, Walkiria Torres and Rene Gallegos, who, who are English teachers and educational uh, 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 source for our young Latino players coming through either the Dominican Academy or the Peoria Academy. Uh, we have been, you know, among the best in class, if not best in class in that area. You know, Andy hired both women who have done a phenomenal job for us and continue to help us evolve. We're now going to take that and try to expand it up to and including educational programs for our coaches, for our affiliate managers, you know, as well as for our young players and, and try to provide we in our professions, whatever they are, you know, and you could be a, you know, a, a butcher, a baker or a candlestick maker and, and continued education is critical to, to your own, you know, personal growth. Yep. And, and uh, Andy will oversee that as well, which we think is a pretty big thing to bite off. And it will continue to make changes for us in a lot of those unmeasurable areas. And Andy's pretty, you know, in tune with the, with the data, but there's a, there is an element that he brings to the table that the rest of us just don't quite have. Right. And, and taking advantage of that is, is the, how we get better. Yeah. So to uh, kind of bring it to the field and, you know, this upcoming season, um, Last year, we obviously saw the uh, breakout of Julio. Um, that could have been, you know, somewhat foreseen. Um, guys like Matt Brash might have been a little bit more under the radar. Um, who's a guy that's coming up right now that Mariner fans can, I don't know, get excited about? And and uh, either either obvious ones or like or, yeah, obvious yeah, or, well, or maybe under the sneaky one. Yeah, yeah, sneaky one. Yeah, I think the I, I've I've actually said this publicly. Recently, I think the guy that comes to spring training and wows everybody is going to be Bryce Miller. Mm. Um, Bryce is a, he's a and I, I I don't want to compare him to other prospects in the industry. He's not as famous as some of the top pitching prospects in baseball right now, but I'm not sure that there's a huge gap between what they do and what he does. He had we think he's got the best or highest impact fastball in minor league baseball period, uh, and the data supports that you know he's got incredible ride on his fastball and and oh by the way it'll tip 100 miles an hour fairly regularly <laughs> he's got a he's got a very good slider uh, the command has come along very quickly for him and there are a lot of traits in his changeup. you know that when we look under the hood at the data that we get back on his changeup that suggests that is a, you know a quickly developing pitch as well so you know when we drafted Bryce we thought all right the the floor here is that you have a great arm who's going to contribute somewhere on a major league staff down the road. The ceiling is is truly can we make the, the, the adjustments necessary to develop him into a starting pitcher. We think that's happening. Um, and the, the, the fun thing is I don't know if we have room. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, he's, he's excited. Incredible. Well, he's I'm excited. so curious. Like, How are you so good at getting these, these bullpen arms? I mean, we had – we had Edwin Diaz in our rotation. We traded him away, and then he like, we turned him from starter to reliever. Not without him making an impact. Without obviously. him, he made Huge an impact. Huge. In the yeah. trade, what we got, the value was amazing. But what I'm asking is, then we go and, and we get Andres Munoz, and you just are able to find well, Paul Seawald. Uh, C- Paul Seawald is probably C- the biggest one. In my uh, and Flexen, for example. But then we got Matt Brash, who we convert, and you seem to make something out of nothing and get a guy in our bullpen with a fastball that's fast as hell. It's going over 100. With yeah. a slider that's got nasty bite. Every one of our relievers, their sliders are coming from different slots. That's got to be confusing for the hitters. I mean, how are you? How are you? What are you doing to just? Is it anything from your experience when you were pitching? Stuff you've developed? How have you? That seems your best. Um, position your best area of the team to develop and stay consistent is our bullpen. There's a, the this one. I wish I could tell you that there is an exact science to bullpen building. We've done it pretty well, and you know more importantly, like you hit on with some of the lesser known names, we, we've done an excellent job up and down the organization with with helping like bringing those guys to light. You know, helping them become the best version of themselves. Mm-hmm. I think that I could go back. You know credit where it's due. Brian DeLunas, who's since passed away, made a a big impact on our organization in that way. And and, in starting the ball rolling, I'm being a little bit more, uh, I guess, 
broad in how we were looking or the, the, the net we were spreading to get to our pitchers in the time since. Trent Blank, you know, another huge difference maker for us. In, in addition to being on our major league staff, he is a director of pitching strategies. We run so many pitchers through a variety of different lenses, and what we're looking for are unique pitch traits, mm. things that this pitcher does that we feel like we can amplify. Mm. And, you know, not just, hey, throw more sliders, less fastballs. It's, and Seawald's a great example. Hey, let's get the arm from here to here. Let's get the slider and the axis from here to there. And, and the adjustments that we're making – we're using modern technology, we're using data, but we're really using the experiences of the, the coaches in our space uh, who've been doing this incredibly well for quite some time now. And, and you know, Bryce Miller is another of those examples, and they're happening throughout our system. We've recently picked up a couple of big arm relievers who have some major league experience that we feel like we can, we can make similar adjustments with, guys like Justin Topa, whose stuff jumps off the – like you watch him pitch and it's – you're wow. How, yeah. how can we help that? And I was going to ask about uh, Topa. So, like, when you call the Brewers and you're, you're acquiring – or you're uh, looking to acquire a Justin Topa, do they ever get, like, cold feet? Like, dang, the Mariners are really good. Why do they want our guy? Like, maybe we should keep him because if they, if they see something yeah, they, in him, maybe we should – They're looking to it. push a little bit further than where they were last year, which was a great season – Right, like what? Uh, yeah, like what? Should we like? What, Why do you guys want Topa? That? Why do you guys want Topa? <laughs> well, we, there's on this one, and and this is as you've my personality. I'll just keep knocking and yep. not. And yep. you know, the the Brewers, to, to their credit, this is an area where they've also excelled. I, th I think, you know, around the league, there are a handful of teams that have done quite well in this space, and and the crew does pretty well in yep. this space. But we have asked about Justin Topa for. You know, three plus years, and it seems like that's with almost all the guys we've been acquiring. Yep. Just keep Jerry. Keep going. Jerry eventually going. gets some. He'd been going after Colton Wong for a long time. We'll wear him down, man. Did you do, we'll did you do any sort of sales job growing up before never. you got to baseball? Yeah. Oh, never. Been a baseball person. Really? Yeah, never. <laughs> you would have excelled. You would have excelled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it's I take not, that back. I sold not. shoes at Kinney's. When, Something. When, you know, all right. You had some teenager. sort of sales experience. Pitchers' advantages, benefits. You know. <laughs> yep. Hey, well, Jerry, I think we're just hitting that thirty-minute mark. Last question I have. Um, you're talking about learning from experiences. One of the things I was most excited last year for us breaking the drought, getting into the playoffs, was to see how Scott's service was going to manage a, a team in the playoffs because it's just so different. Yeah. And with closing a game with George Kirby coming off the bench, I'm sure a lot of these moves are decided prior to the game. You guys talk about it. How do you think yourself, service, the rest, the rest of the coaching staff, what did you learn most from this most recent trip to the playoffs? that you think you can take with you next year and continue on? There, the, this is maybe the thing I'm most proud of that we've been able to accomplish over the course of the years. And I know if you, you spoke with Andy, he will have beaten this, this drum quite a bit. You know, we establish a process on the front end and, and our goal is to build a process that, that allows us to pay attention to it rather than the surrounding uh, noise. Mm -hmm. And when we got into the postseason, we reacted like it was any other day. And we went through our same pregame bullpen meetings. We went through our same – we understood the urgency. You could feel the energy in the moment. And therein, as it, as Scott's ability to maintain control over his own heartbeat, to maintain, you know, a, a logical decision-making process while things are moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and sometimes you're going to get them right, you know, like with Curb, and sometimes you're, you're going to get them wrong. But for the most part, we had our decisions made, and we, we had a game plan laid out, and Scott can go in, and just like the 160-whatever games before uh, that moment, he just go out and execute with the full faith of the team around him. And uh, there's – we were methodical, and mm -hmm. I think that's when you look at successful teams in the postseason, they don't change the routine. You know, it's a, and, and when you look in their dugout, you don't see a staff or a manager especially where it's moving very quickly. You look in the dugout, and you, for 10 years you see Bobby Cox with his hands in his mm -hmm. back yep, pocket right. or yep, Joe right. Torre looking like he's, you know, giving someone the fatherly speech on the, the, the dugout bench. And, yeah. and, I, and I do think that Scott managed – it, he managed those two playoff series in the same way he managed everything that led up to it, which I yep. think is critical.